Reviewer assignment is somehow an easy matchmaking problem. And I've taken this uh, example as an exemplar, well, since it relates a bit to our scientific world, at least the one I live in. And perhaps you'll live in too someday. Anyway, uh, other examples just to give you one is uh, uh, in a couple of years back we had a master thesis who was doing um, matchmaking at the World Music Exposition in Berlin where the idea is you have musicians, you have producers, you have other services in the music business and people have a different profile and now you want to match them and uh, th then you tr try more or less to come up with a, with a, with a timetable of placements in, in, in rooms where people get together at tables over a whole day. So this is a bit of a, of a richer problem and the reviewer assignment problem is, well, quite easier. So the idea is the following. Before a conference takes place, the program chairs, the guys that are responsible for the scientific uh, program of a conference, have to recruit reviewers. And the, th the task of these reviewers is to write uh, reviews about the papers that are going to be submitted later on to the conference. And normally each paper receives three uh, reviews. And so you can imagine that this is quite, a, quite an evolved process. Nowadays we're very lucky that we have actually web services for this. And so there are two things that more or less happen. So first of all, uh, people send in their submissions with abstracts, with keywords, uh, and then the reviewers go through this list and they more or less declare their preferences. So they say, oh, I'd like to uh, review this paper, this, I'm interested in that. There may be a second preference that it's doable for me, I'm competent, but it's not really my favorite. And finally, they have to declare their conflict of interest in case it's their supervisor or their students or other, other people that they are somehow related to in a positive or negative way. They declare their conflict of interest so that they are not going to get assigned a paper, this paper, the paper at hand, right? So that's more or less the idea. Uh, and then once all papers are sent in, uh, an assignment has to be made between uh, the papers and the reviewers. And this assignment somehow should be nice. And nice means more or less, well, I, re I know this from own experience, so you start and you, you, you set up nice constraints, but then it turns out it won't work that way, right? So, and then it's nice to have a formalism that is elaboration tolerant, right? That where you can easily more or less modify your constraints and uh, to adapt to the current situation, because you always have papers that receive not so many, um, pre not so many likes, right, so to speak, or, or others that receive a lot, and you may have actually not anticipated the right balance among the competences of the reviewers and etc etc right so it's really a task that evolves and where you want to to start adapting the the constraints on the solutions on the fly so it's not only that nice means oh you have all valid solutions and then you only select the optimum ones also can i actually find some and how to adapt that okay so here's again the problem instance and the problem class just to to set this in stone so the problem instance is you have a set of papers and you have a set of reviewers and the reviewers have declared their preferences, first choice, second choice, conflict of interest. And then the goal is to find a nice assignment of three reviewers to each paper. And actually the example I, I'll show to you has been devised by Ilka Nemela, who was at the time a chairman of uh, logic, the conference on logic programming and nomotonic reasoning, and who is now the president of Alto University. And I hope he still uses ASP for tasks in, at his university. Let me zip it and look at his encoding. The problem instance, just indicated here by the first few lines, but you can imagine that there's much more, reflect the database of the conference management system. So you have a table uh, of all the papers, a table of all the reviewers, their first choices, their second choices, and their conflict of interests. Okay, otherwise this assignment also nicely follows the generate and test methodology. So the first thing we do is we generate uh, solution candidates. And so for each paper, we want to select exactly three reviewers among all review, reviewing a, a paper possibilities. So again, if you have thousand reviewers, and we now look at paper 42, then we will have here thousand possibilities of people to assess this paper and we are selecting or we have to select exactly three of them right that's the idea so again keep in mind once we have uh, described our our generator we can assume that we have a solution candidate and now just 
pose conditions on, on this candidate, what conditions it should satisfy, and what conditions it should not satisfy. Okay, anyway, so here, is, here are some thoughts. The, the, the first one is very important, and I think this is really a hard constraint. So you cannot assign a paper to a reviewer who has declared this paper as her uh, conflict of interest. The second con integrity constraint is actually a very nice one, and I doubt that this really worked in the end. So it says you must not assign uh, a paper to a reviewer who has not ha declared this as his first or second choice. You always have papers that where it's difficult to find reviewers, and I'm pretty sure that this was weakened afterwards. Okay. Okay, the last uh, integrity constraint more or less says you should give six among six and nine uh, papers to each reviewer. So you should each reviewer should review at, at least six and at most nine. So actually keep in mind so whenever there is a not, since it's the, the integrity constraint, it must not be the case, and then you have a negative condition, you can just read this by reading this condition here. So you have a reviewer, and the reviewer more or less gets assigned between six and nine papers. Okay, now again we are still about to analyze the solution candidate, the assignment that was guessed here, and now here an auxiliary um, predicate is defined. So when is an assignment uh, some uh, an assignment to a second class paper. So you just define that an assignment was made as part of the solution candidate that was guessed here, and it was a, a secondary uh, preference. And here you say again, you're very nice to your reviewers. You say, oh, uh, it must not be the case that three or more secondary choices have been assigned. Again, I doubt that this can really really be implemented. Um, all the time. But anyway, that's exactly why what I like so much about this, this example, that you can imagine that you can easily then change the constraints and perhaps turn them from hard constraints into soft constraints or perhaps reformulate other constraints. Right? And last but not least, um, among all, all feasible solutions, feasible assignments, valid assignments, you want to select the optimum ones. And here in this case, the idea is to take those assignments where you made the fewest secondary, uh, where you assigned the fewest secondary choices to reviewers. Again, this is done with the minimize statement, where we minimize the sum of all assignments of secondary papers. So we more or less just count that, and this is actually why here we put a one. Okay, so this is a more or less one attempt for a reviewer assignment, as I say. Uh, once you have all the data and you push the button, surprises normally show up. Another thing I would like to explain here again is that the aggregates that we are, have been we're using and the choices here and there are all actually, um, let's say, some more comfort expression abbreviation of something actually more detailed. Let's look at this a little bit. Throughout this encoding, we've already been using different variants of cardinality constraints, which are sets of atoms after grounding, along with some syntactic sugar, which enforces that ex here exactly three elements of the resulting set of ground atoms are added to the stable model. Here we want at least six and at most nine, and here we want at least three. Here they are, these cardinality constraints occur in the body, here they are in the head. But in fact, these are more or less, well, convenience features because under, underneath, the Klingo takes them and translates them into count aggregates. And somehow we've already seen this here with the minimize statement where we're a bit more explicit, right? So we minimize the sum of all B assignments and we count each of these assignments by one. So here we make this really explicit and here we talk about terms, right? Because after all, the sum uh, has to go over numbers. Um, and in, with count aggregates, we more or less count objects. And even though here we write, we write, again, as a convenience feature, we write atoms that we count. In reality, this is translated as follows. So we have here a count aggregate. We push the original atom, just let me go back, the original atom towards the conditions. And then here we have just tuples. And then this aggregate here counts the number of tuples with a certain property. This is again translated further. I just wanted to tell you that underneath actually there is a richer, a more precise syntax. And for instance, here the equal three was already pretty precise. Here this expands to a smaller equal and here a smaller equal, and here is one as well. So this was just to tell you a little bit 
already that you can write things in more detail by using explicitly the aggregates and that the other forms are convenience features. And there's of course one thing that you may already have been wondering about, why is there a, not only a 1 but also a P and a R, but this is something I will try to explain with a, with a whiteboard, at least one on my iPad. Let's see how this works. Okay, but before that, let's first look at the very last uh, of our case studies, namely planning.